Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Ag My Optics, a podcast where two, actually, no, not today, a podcast where three adult men discuss, overanalyze and generally take a kid's toy and media franchise a little too seriously. The toy and media franchise in question usually being the Transformers, and today is no exception, as we take a deep dive into the peculiar little corner of the Transformers franchise known as Headmasters. I am the guy who does all the work around here, and I call myself Orion Gear. And with me is my young, work shy co host, Virtual Dave. That's me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in a first for this podcast, we have a very special guest in the form of friend of the podcast, Michael Quintazon. Say hello to our listeners, Michael, and maybe tell them a little bit about your experience with Transformers. Hello, listeners. Great to be here on AG, my optics. <laughs> Um, I, I suppose I, you know, it's somewhat, you have a somewhat different position, you know, perspective from either of you, I guess, in that I just really was into Transformers when I was like a child and I sort of collected a lot of the generation one ones, played with them, broke them. And I also <laughs> was very into like the Marvel comics at the time. And I sort of read most of that through to the end. Yeah. Cause we're kind of from the same, well, you're only, you're what, year, year younger than me. I think so, yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we both grew up on the Marvel comics. Right. Well, great. Um, so as well as being like a original G1 fan, Michael has a very special reason for being here, which we will reveal later. <laughs> a bit of a teaser. Anyway, um, Dave, you wanted to talk about Headmasters. Why the hell is that? Because I, I, I threw the gauntlet down in saying that this is like one of the best little corners of Transformers. It's a... Uh... Fantastic gimmick. Yes. <laughs> true, true. Well, I, sp- I kind of wrote a little itinerary of what we should talk about. And um, I, think the first, I think the first thing we should probably tackle is um, what are headmasters? <laughs> Who wants to tell me what a headmaster is? <laughs> I, I can have a go. Um, a headmaster is basically like, a, I would say, I mean, actually, in a way, like I was thinking about this, and it, it's not that easy because... You know, you can explain, there's a basic concept, which is like, it's basically a transformer where his head is also a transformer and his head comes off and turns into a little dude. Mm-hmm. But then what, who that little dude is or how he got onto his head, is, <laughs> there are many explanations for that. And they're all, they're all quite confusing. Yeah, and some of them are batshit crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, what, and I suppose it's the same for you, Dave. I mean, you came, came at it from a different direction because Michael and I definitely... G1 was our first experience of Headmasters. Was it for you? Um, no, I was purely exposed to the Japanese version of Headmasters for the, lo- oh. for the longest time. Yeah, you were, weren't you? Didn't you have it on VHS or something? I had a VHS as a kid and I used to watch that all the time before I even watched G1. So It's it... so bizarre. You, <laughs> you, you're you growing up in London and <laughs> your experience of Headmasters being the Japanese cartoon, which we will get onto later, but it is... One of the most bizarre TV series from the Transformers uh, pantheon. It is. I mean, I spoke about it before on the podcast, but it's a, it's a very strange part of my childhood because the box of VHS cassette had um, Star Saber on it and right. the episodes had the, the Transformers victory intro. So it was a very confusing VHS tape in itself. So, so it was just a mishmash of Japanese cartoons. No, 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 no. They were all like the first ten or eleven episodes of Headmasters, but they began and ended with the victory intro and outro. Why? I don't know. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> right. Well, um, I mean, I've I've watched some of that. Well, I've watched quite. A bit. I watched a bit of it in preparation for this, and it is pretty hard going, to be honest. <laughs> but I suppose we can talk about the differences between different types of Headmasters. Mm-hmm. We basically got like two versions. You've got the US stroke Hasbro version of what a headmaster is, and then this is within G1, mm-hmm. and then you've got the Japanese stroke Takara version, which in the US they're organic beings, nebulons mostly, sometimes humans, mm-hmm. who um, basically kind of bond with the robot in question and become a little, a little suited up robot man that forms their head and then they share thoughts and they share their consciousness whereas in japan it's uh, the little guy the little head is the is the transformer mm-hmm. and the uh, body is um is just like a it's called a transtector and it's basically 
uh, a thing they pilot. So, for example, with like Fortress Maximus, the the little tiny guy is called Fortress, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so he's he's in charge, <laughs> and the rest of it's just a big um, mindless machine. It's like a mech almost, I would say. But pretty yeah. much, yeah. But then they they are robots as well. Like I mean, I had I didn't watch any of the Japanese cartoon, um, mm. or I haven't really ever seen it. But like reading the explanation, I think it actually makes more sense than the American version, which which always seems to kind of like spin into being quite bizarre when you think about it for even a second. Yes. <laughs> and I guess if you just take the toys, it's like yeah, it's a little robot, and he pilots a tank or a plane or a helicopter or big crocodile yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) then he also can turn that into like a big robot which he sort of bonds with i mean it you know it's it's like it sort of feels closer to what the toy idea was yeah and i think it probably was i mean i don't know actually talking about the toys this was the this year 1987 was the year where hasbro and takara started pretty much making brand new toys for the transformers line previously they'd used toys from previous um, incarnations of uh, Takara lines such as Diaclone and Microchange. So this was the, when they were they were actually developing toys for the Transformers line. Mm-hmm. Oh. So I was just say, wondering whether the it was a it seems like a very Japanese idea to have a little guy piloting a mech. So I wonder whether Takara had more control over the the kind of concept of headmasters originally. I would I would think so because they kind of carried that on into the next series as well because with um pretenders and uh they really push that little guy in a in a machine within something else yes they do in fact in the the series after headmasters which is uh super god master force <laughs> <laughs> great name for a tv series they have headmaster juniors mm-hmm. their heads are little anime kids with um things called I think they're called master braces, which are basically bracelets that they kind of clash together and then they transform, they right, morph. <laughs> it's very Mighty Morphin. It's very Super Sentai. Um, <laughs> they morph into little headmaster guys and then they can jump on top of the head of their transtector and uh, off they go. Mm. So it's, it's very Japanese in concept, that one, even more so than the little robots. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you, you may correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think in terms of G1, it really marks the point where they kind of stop making things that are just a robot that turns into a car. It's like everything after that has a gimmick, like a new gimmick of some kind. Yeah, uh, Headmasters is the first line-wide gimmick, I think, that happened. Mm. Because previous to that, I mean, you had combiners, I guess that's a gimmick. Mm. But That's a gimmick. But still, I mean, they were... They were just in there with everything else. They were, oh, we just brought the combiners in. They're a bit of a big deal. Here they are. The special teams are here. But when you get to 87, pretty much the entire lineup of, of, of G1 is headmasters or yeah. target masters. They're all kind of in there. There's a Nebulon partner to most, not everything, but for, for a lot of things at different price points and different mm. sizes across the line. It's very kind of mm. unified. Power masters. Uh, yeah, Power Masters, I think, came the year after. And it also set up the whole premise of calling whatever it is something master. <laughs> Except the Pretenders. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking the other day as well. I'm surprised they weren't called the Pretender Masters. <laughs> yeah, you'd think they might be. Although they were, weren't they, what, what were they called in, um, what, what do you call the trilogy that came before War for Cybertron, uh, Oh, Dave? the Prime Wars trilogy. Oh, Prime Wars, yeah. Mm-hmm. So didn't you have some kind of pretenders that were called something masters. Uh, oh, gosh, yeah, what were they called? They were, just called, they were called Prime Masters, yeah. Prime Masters, there you go. <laughs> Very creative, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, they brought pretenders back in that line. Yeah. Sort of. Not nearly as well executed as the originals, I don't think. They were little tiny uh, little things. They, I think it's because they were small, but then... Uh, yeah, I like them. They're, they're great little figures. Yeah. <laughs> My objects! One thing that I think you were kind of alluding to there, Michael, was mm. the Japanese idea seems more sensible. Yes. Especially when you get into how they went about it, especially in the comics, in the UK and US comics, the Marvel comics, because they have to undergo quite a lot of like serious, uh, what's the word? Uh, sort of surgery, really. It's, it's like, <laughs> yeah, there's a kind of reference to them, like they're sort of like altering their joints and stuff like this. And I'm like, this is a bit grim for a seven year old, which I probably was <laughs> when it came out. But I mean, I think I think in, in contrast 
in the US cartoon, it was also sort of weird. It, and I think it's characteristic of what that cartoon is like, that they just seem to fly through everything. And they're just like, well, the best thing we can do now is just to take our heads off and you on my head now. <laughs> And they're like, yeah. everyone says like, yeah, I agree, I agree with this. Uh, proceed, <laughs> <laughs> proceed with it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it very much is kind of like, um, we're all going to uh, turn into heads and guns because brainstorm said so. <laughs> yeah, and in, in in the comic, it was like I think they kind of gave it, maybe it was to give it a bit of weight that they were like really taking, you know, the ne- the nebulans were taking a real yeah. risk by doing this, and they, they were they were being they were it was self sacrificing. Yeah, and it was a kind of big deal, and it was a uh, Galen was. You probably won't know this, Dave. You've not read a lot of the mm-hmm. G One comic, but before Spike was the headmaster for um, Fortress Maximus, there was a Nebulon called Galen who right. was basically kind of the only voice of reason on Nebulos when the uh, when the headmasters turned up. Well, the guys who would eventually become headmasters, because essentially in the comic, it's kind of similar to the cartoon. Yeah, they just turn up on their planet or... Well, Fortress Maximus um, is sick of war, basically. And he's like the leader of the Autobots on Cybertron because, you know, Prime's off on Earth doing whatever he's up to. So he's like sick and tired of war, so he decides just to just to leave. And he finds this planet called Nebulos and he takes him and, him, him and his pals that include people like Blur and Cup and Hot Rod and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, all the all the people who would eventually become headmasters and target masters and some of the monster bots and basically whoever was going to be in the toy line for 1987. <laughs> yeah, that that's kind of it. It's sort of they they very much sort of pushed it, and I think this was true in like the cartoon and the the comic. Is it's like this is kind of a new beginning for the Transformers, yeah. and I, I thought the the comic story really kind of mirrors the old arrival from Cybertron stuff quite a bit, where they sort of like start off on Cybertron and they have like a reason to go and they build this spaceship, mm-hmm. and they don't really know what happened to Prime. They're just like this is just history. He he disappeared. Yeah, and and he's like, meanwhile, me Fortress Maximus, I've been fighting this war for like four million years, and I've come to the conclusion. <laughs> There were a bit of a stalemate. <laughs> it's never really going to end yeah. unless one of us just leaves. I noticed that. that he, he, he mentions how long it's been going on and it's a ridiculous amount of time. It's like... <laughs> yeah. It's like millennia. Fortress Maximus tells us the war has been going on for 50,000 Vaughns. An editor's note helpfully informs us that one Vaughn equals 83 Earth years. So, over 4 million years. That's one long war. And he's like, I've just decided this is a bad idea. (laughs) (laughs) I guess the whole thing then sort of plays out again. You sort of see the war just starts again on Nebulus when the Decepticons catch up with them. And then they get in the same stalemate very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm. There's a bit I really liked where they the Autobots have to create the target masters out of necessity because they've like handed over their guns. Yeah. And then the next issue, the Decepticons are just like, Okay, we've we've um we've gotten around that advantage and made our own target masters, and it's just like <laughs> sides are completely evenly matched, and every time one of them gets like a mild advantage, it's an arms race. Uh, the other one catches up it really really quickly, and then now we're sucking in these completely innocent people into this conflict, and then eventually they they just leave again. <laughs> yeah, that that pays off quite well. I really like the way that that well, the story was told through a four part mini series called Transformers Headmasters in the in the US comic. Mm. And in the UK, because Hasbro UK were trying to sell headmasters to kids, they got Simon Furman to write some extra stories to fill it out because obviously it came out weekly rather than monthly. So the mm-hmm. the US story was basically a backup story in the back of the UK comic and it was split into several sections. But originally it's a four-parter. But what I really like about that four-part story is that um, by the end of it, you've got Galen on one side and... Uh, Lord Zarek on the other side mm. and both of them in the end end up working together to get the Transformers off their planet yeah. essentially <laughs> that's like the only thing they can really agree on <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah they because Lord Zarek realises he's he's going mad and he's becoming controlled by Scorponok's more powerful mind mm. so he basically frees Galen and says you need to you need to leave the planet and I know Scorpnock and his Decepticons will follow you, and then we'll finally have peace again. <laughs> Obviously, he is going to follow them as the head of Scorpnock, mm-hmm. but at least uh, 
Nebulos is safe. Um, so it's quite. I really like that about the story. Yeah, he, he's not. He's not a. Uh, and you know, and I, I think I read this probably when I was seven or eight. Mm. And it's kind of nice to see stuff in these sort of children's media. That's not. It's not a. He's not. He's not a one-dimensional baddie. Like he, he's. He's a bad guy, and he makes basically a lot of bad decisions. And he's not. You know, he doesn't really seem to have good ideas. But he's. He's sort of trying to do the right thing. He's just wrong. Yeah, he's mm. just a bit of an asshole politician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he, he's he's xenophobic. I guess. Mm. You know, he he um he he just immediately thinks it's like the transform these these new guys are a threat to the stability of our society, and we need to get rid of them. And he becomes very sort of obsessed with that. Yeah, yeah, he does. It, it, I mean, and his reasoning doesn't always make an awful lot of sense, but it's kind of understandable. Um, yeah, if I a mean, bunch of giant robots turned up, you can imagine being a bit a bit wary of them. Yeah. I think you would. I think. I, I think you would. would um, it's probably right because they're coming and talking about a war that they've been having for well, yeah. a millennia. Yeah, <laughs> it's like oh, we don't want it here. <laughs> yeah, Galen's a little bit too happy to just accept that they're friendly. <laughs> but but Zarek, really early on, Zarek is just engineering a war, which is very yeah. <laughs> and he, he's, he contact. I think he contacts Cybertron somehow and says like, "We've got these guys have turned up. Can you send some of your other robots over to clear them out, please?" And Scorpion looks like, "Yes, I agree to this." And then he just comes and starts trying to take over the planet. Yeah. So it's Eric's fault, really. <laughs> yeah. Basically, Scorpion goes, "Oh, um, yeah, we'll come and sort that little <laughs> problem out, and we'll take over yeah. your planet, and we'll kill you all." Were they putting them in bubbles? At one point, I thought that was yes. bizarre, and it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> that was just... <laughs> it seemed to be a weird, contrived way of getting rid of the populace of ne- of Nebulon. Yeah, they basically were like, "We're going to stick them in these bubbles and throw them into space." Well, they could have just stepped on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could have done a. They could have just shot them all. Like, there's no reason why they had to come up with a weird way of disposing of them. No, I, I, I felt like maybe they were going somewhere with that, and then they dropped it. Yeah, I think these things were always done quite quickly, weren't they? You know, it's, uh, they need to churn this material out. My optics! So, what happened to the leaders in the comics? Is is Galvatron not in charge at this point? No. No. At this point, I mean, Optimus is... Where are we in the continuity of, like, the kind of Earth G1 stuff? Because I was very confused. So this was 1987. So Optimus Prime is on Earth. Right. Um, Or possibly dead at this point? I don't think he is dead at this point. I think he's come back by now. I think he... No, I think he is. I think I think he's still dead from having blown himself up in that computer game and put his brain on the floppy disk. Quite, quite possibly. <laughs> and, and then, and then he, um, he's brought back by Power Master program, but I can't really remember how that works. Yeah. We've looked into this, and Michael is correct. It's a long story, but essentially, in separate but connected incidents, both Optimus Prime and Megatron got blown up and are assumed dead. In their absence, Grimlock and Shockwave have taken control of the Autobots and Decepticons, respectively. Of course, neither Prime or Megatron are really dead. Like Michael says, Prime was blown up as a result of a computer game incident. A copy of Prime's mind still exists on a floppy disk, and eventually this will be used to bring him back as Power Master Prime. Megatron, on the other hand, having been driven mad by the aforementioned apparent death of Optimus Prime, goes on an insane rampage, culminating in him appearing to kill himself by blowing up a space bridge with him on it. Of course, it doesn't kill him, but exiles him to the slums of Cybertron, where, due to amnesia, he wanders as a confused bum until his memories return, and gets himself conjoined with Ratchet for a bit. As you do. The movie played out slightly differently in the co- in the comic books. Right. Um, he was already a power master by the time the movie happened. Oh, right. I think there's so much time travel shenanigans in the in the Marvel comics that basically the kind of this timeline of Transformers the movie is sort of, sort of like changed and it will just it will goes different. Yes, but he does die. But he die, dies after unleashing the power of the Matrix and kind of ruining everything for everybody in a way. <laughs> <laughs> but not on purpose. But yeah, I don't think because Galvatron at the time is a time traveler. I think so. I'm not sure he's not fighting yeah. Ultra Magnus somewhere else. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, Ultra Magnus was on Cybertron and then came to Earth in the past during Target 2006. <laughs> it's so complicated, actually. It's really kind of breaking my brain trying to like think about how it all works. Yeah. <laughs> but. Essentially, essentially, at this point in time, the head honchos on Cybertron are Fortress Maximus and Scorponok. 
That's all you need to know. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. And like, as far as the the other the original G one guys, they're just gone. They they haven't seen them in millions of years. Yeah, but I, th- I think they then catch up with them. Like they go, you know, the end of this story is them fight going off to Earth to try and meet up with the other Autobots who they sort of found out about. Yeah. Yeah, because they basically get a distress call through from Earth saying they need help. Right. And that's where and that's where the headmasters all head off so that they can go and become part of the larger battle on Earth. My so just to explain, when they get to Earth, mm-hmm. pretty much the first thing that happens is Scorponok and uh, Fortune Maximus have a big fight. Spike happens to be there. And uh, mm-hmm. Scorponok basically tries to use Spike as a means to of which to defeat um, Fortress Maximus by, like, blasting something above him and having it fall on Spike. Distracting him, yeah. Yeah, and Galen jumps in the way and gets killed. And as a result, Spike then takes up the mantle as the new headmaster of... Uh... So Galen is not he- the headmaster of, uh, of Fort Max for very long, really. <laughs> no. Just a means to an end, really. They thought, well, we can't, we can't very well have Spike on Cybertron, so we're going to have to find a way of uh, crowbarring him in later. But this is why, this is why um, I think um, Michael's right about the Japanese one making more sense, because, I mean, eventually they're just going to have a skeleton inside their heads. Like, then, then, then what happens? Do they keep churning in new people to be their heads for them? Yeah, that's also true. This is this is I feel like a question that maybe has been in the back of my mind since 1987. But like, <laughs> do they take the original heads with them when they leave Nebulos, or are they still there? And can the old heads talk? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what's happened in in the cartoon? They they said something like, "Transfer your memory chip to your chest panel," and they're like, "Okay." And I was like, "Well, I'm kind of glad we got something there because it in, it feels like it feels like they would have another head that, would, that maybe they could put back on later or." Could sort yeah. of sit on a shelf and dispense pearls of wisdom. Because in really. the comics, when they do the headmaster process, all the heads of the headmasters, because they in the comics they rip their heads off on purpose in order to <laughs> prove that they that 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 they that they come in peace. That they're peaceful. Basically. Very strange way of behaving, <laughs> but you know, fine. It's just part of their culture. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Cyber trading culture. <laughs> this is how I prove that I'm uh, that I come in peace. I rip my head off, but they're all on like a shelf, <laughs> and they. I think Galen comes in and turns Fortress Maximus's head on to have a talk with him. Yeah, and when they do the process, there's a little blurb or something that explains that the old head of the the original head is somehow in like radio contact with the body. Yes, I remember that now. So the two minds are so that the guy who turns into the head is the new head, and the old head is on a sh- on a shelf somewhere. Yeah, like radioing in uh, their thoughts. In the cartoon, they more sort of climbed inside the head, and then they were piloting it like a mech. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So it was very different. It was it was far more um, kind of Japanese in that respect, in that they yeah, yeah, just I mean... kind of sat behind controls. I think even though I, I like the Marvel comic, I think it probably does make the least sense, in, just in terms of the, the explanation for the Headmasters, what, what the hell they are. Yeah, I think one, I think it's best just to forget about it once, uh, once it's all <laughs> once, done. Once they're off Nebulos, forget it. Forget any of this. <laughs> <laughs> just a guy. They're just a robot whose head turns into a guy, and that's all you need to know. Exactly, absolutely. My it's, so, it's, so, it's just so... Because I know so little about these comics... And I know almost every other bit of the Headmaster's origins from the cartoon and the Japanese version. Mm. But this is just, it sounds so different. It's Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I've gone over this before, but as UK Transformers fans, the comic books were the main source of fiction mm. because the, t- the cartoon wasn't on TV much. It was very hard to see the cartoon. I think maybe it was on cable or satellite TV. Mm, it was. I, I couldn't watch it. I, I used to rent rent them from a video shop. Mm. And you could get really sporadic episodes. So there's maybe about 10 episodes I've seen like lots of times. But apart from... I mean, I had never seen the Headmasters one before before this. Wow. That was yeah. part of my research. Well, there was only like... I think there were maybe six, possibly less, Video Gems videos. 
Uh, yes, I've probably seen all of those. <laughs> yeah, and they had about most of them had two or three. Epi- well, actually, no one had one had all of the more than meets the eye three parter on it. It was called Arrival from Cybertron, and then I had one that had War Dawn and something else on it. I can't remember what the other episode was. It was a key to Vector Sigma, obviously. Considering Orion watched this episode hundreds of times as a kid, you'd think he'd remember. He is right about the number of Video Gems releases, though. There were six. But it was one where they introduced the aerial bots, and when you met Orion Pax yes. and um, saw him become... Um, Optimus Prime. Prime, yeah. But that's it. There was only like a certain number of videos and you you know, you either bought them in Woolies or whatever, or you uh or you went and rented them. Wow. But you could get the comic incredibly easily, like I, I used to just get it from the news agent. Yeah, me too, yeah. It was probably one of Marvel's bigger titles at the time, in a way. So the industry was, was different. <laughs> exactly, and with it and with it coming out weekly, you got so much information from there. Mm. So, like, my experience of most of the characters is, mo- is mostly based on the comics, which is what I was going to say, because in the comics, Fortress Maximus and Scorponok are not giants. They are the same <laughs> height as everyone else, they're, pretty much. They're sort of a bit bigger, aren't they? Yeah. So a little bit taller. <laughs> Apparently, this was because um, the writers of the comic struggled with the fact that these, these guys had been set up as, as leaders, as kind of high-ranking and they're like, how can we have like a high ranking giant? It's going to be really hard for them to kind of uh, yeah. communicate with and be on the same level as the rest of their troops. Oh. It'd be difficult in meetings, basically. Like, <laughs> exactly. You'd have to really <laughs> shout, and Chrome Dome would be like, I can't hear you, Full Max. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what I was it's saying like, to you. Can you crouch down, please? <laughs> it doesn't make sense that that, because that is, um, the whole gimmick helps that. Like, you just become the smaller bot. Yeah, but then they'd have to do that, wouldn't they? They'd have to take their head off, turn into a, the smaller one. And also, Scorponok doesn't do that. Scorponok only has one headmaster. Yeah, that's true. He has a sort of canopy thing over the top of his uh, of mm. Lord Zarak. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, in the cartoon, they did have Cerebros, but in, in the. He is called, I think it's called Cerebros, isn't he? The Fort Max. Yeah, C- Cerebros or Cerebros. Cerebros, yeah. yeah. But in, in the comic story, he actually wasn't present. It just. Um, Galen just turned right into his head. Pretty but, much. Uh, I think he is in it later. I don't know how they square that one. The short answer is it's inconsistent. During the trip to Earth, Galen did have Fortress Maximus's body doubled in size for some reason. Something to do with winning the war quicker or something. At this point, Fort Max's Cerebros headmaster, which Galen would in turn become the head of, was created. From that point forward, Fort Max did appear larger, but it was sporadic. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think in the comics, they kind of... I know it's actually in that story, they kind of switch backwards and forwards between the look of... I think like, it was just a continuity mistake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, because they had a sort of Cerebros-style head. Mm, on, on top of Fort Max's body. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was a mistake, though. I think there's loads of mistakes in those comics. They, often call each, they sometimes call each other the wrong name and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I noticed that. They colour them wrong. In fact, there's a whole scene where um, the... The Decepticons turn up on Nebulos and then they they walk in and they do that kind of thing where they go, hi, here are the toys you can buy in your local uh, Woolworths. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. They, they do it a lot in the in the cartoon as well. It's like they're just yeah. constantly calling each other by name. Yeah. And I think it creates quite a weird atmosphere. Like they all know each other really, really well, <laughs> including like their enemies, you know. So they're just like, it's sort of like, is this like a sort of what a social gathering is for like Cybertronians? Yeah. There's it's like just t- a bit of a, a, a punch up and we sort of <laughs> shoot each other. And, <laughs> and we're like, um... You won't catch me this time, weird wolf. And he's like, I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> high brow. <laughs> so you've seen Rebirth, Dave? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. What are your thoughts on Rebirth? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I remember the, the one thing I wanted to note from that is, um, is Daniel stuck in RC's head forever now? Is, has he got like, he broke his legs or something, and he had to be RC's headmaster. Is that is that permanent? <laughs> yes, I I think that was heavily implied. Um, I I also watched this. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like it was used as a kind of throwaway excuse. Yeah, it certainly was. Yeah, it's like, um, well, Daniel needs to be a headmaster now because he's hurt himself. 
but we won't refer to this later. <laughs> I think he could have just volunteered. And I thought it was also very strange that um, his sort of transformed mode was RC. He was RC's head, but then his sort of transformed upright mode was just his exosuit yeah, yeah. and transformed yeah. moving again. <laughs> So it's like, I don't really understand what on earth they did there. I think that's just laziness. I think they're just like, yes. we can't be bothered to come up with a new design here. But why did they do that? Because RC didn't get a toy, let alone was a headmaster toy, right? No. Well, there was a prototype for an RC toy way back when the movie came out, but it never... Back then, it, the idea was kids aren't going to buy a girl toy. All right, okay. Or a pink one. <laughs> Probably more that. I mean, I think I'd have been interested in an RC toy because I like the character in Transformers the movie. She was fun. I think that Hasbro made a mistake there. I think that they assumed that people wouldn't. I think loads of people would have bought it. Yeah. So it was, con- it was the conventional wisdom of the time, wasn't it? Mm. We're not totally sure of the reason behind RC not getting a toy during G1, but we can confirm there were at least three attempts to do one. The first did get as far as a hand-sculpted prototype, but it wasn't a headmaster. However, there was also some concept art showing Chrome Dome's car mode painted pink and labelled RC. Not that that would have looked anything like she did in Rebirth. But yeah, it was odd that they made her a headmaster. I suppose they just needed someone who could connect with Daniel. I suppose so. And they went, oh, a lady obviously will connect with, uh, <laughs> with a little boy. Yeah. It could have been worse. It could have been Wheelie. It could have been Wheelie. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, in, in addition to the fact that they all talk a mile a minute in Rebirth, they co- they're constantly, constantly explaining what's happening. Mm-hmm. Everything's happening very, very quickly. They introduce about 20 new characters in the space of three episodes. <laughs> one thing I did notice is that no one can say Scourge properly. What do they Scourge. Say? <laughs> they say Squirge. <laughs> Nothing you served up could ever humiliate an Autobot, Squirge. <laughs> yes, I think I noticed that. <laughs> Both Prime and RC go Squirge <laughs> for some bizarre reason. Give it to me, Squirge! So, can we, do we have time for a, do we have time to do that take again? No. <laughs> 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 Move on, it doesn't matter. <laughs> get through it. <laughs> We've got a lot to say here. We've got a lot to get through. Let's just plough on. Something I noticed, they, they introduced a strange new MacGuffin where Prime was like, there's a boring fight at the start and then Prime is like, I've never told anyone about this before, but this is weird sort of little black thing I keep in a cupboard and as Autobot leader, it's my duty to look after it, protect oh, it with yeah, my life. Yeah. And then that yeah. goes back and forth between the various characters for the entire thing. And I was like, they said something about how like this is the energy source that was used to create the first Autobot. So I was like, well, they're going to use this to make the headmasters somehow, they make new Transformers or something. But then they didn't do that. And I think Galvatron just wanted to use it to blow up the sun for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That is that weird. It was a kind of spiral shape thing. I've forgotten what it's called. Yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah. Doesn't remember. It doesn't matter what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> Michael is right. It doesn't matter what it's called. But we looked it up anyway. It's the key to the plasma energy chamber which Prime tells us is the foundry where the original Autobots' bodies were forged. Interestingly, it made a reappearance in Beast Machines over ten years later. Also notice that Ultra Magnus once again appeared to die while failing to protect the MacGuffin of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the story. <laughs> <laughs> and then was just revived in a, in a, in a sort of like hand-wavy way. That's his job. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And and you see, we'll get onto it in a minute, but you see a similar thing happening in Headmasters, mm. as in the Japanese series. Mm. But there, there is a part in a, in Rebirth where like Prime has to go to the center of the planet or something, doesn't he? And he meets, he meets the ghost of Alpha Trion. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a, there was a point that made me lol, as it were, <laughs> uh, where, where Alpha Trion says something and then... Prime just goes, that makes no sense. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, too right, Prime. None of this makes any sense. My I mean, there, there are some highlights in it. Like, I really like the introduction of the punch, counter-punch, and when he meets the clones for, like, maybe one minute, that scene happens. But it's, it's an interesting dynamic that he can be a, a Decepticon and an Autobot. But yeah. he just executed it really badly. Like he turned up and pretended to be one side and then 
went around the corner and changed and came back out again. And then he had that weird he had that weird line where he says something like, "My Autobot counterpart is around here somewhere." My brother. Like, was, what, yeah, what does that like, mean? <laughs> you mean they mean you mean they know that there's two of you, or that you're? I, so what? I mean, I didn't understand anything about that bit. I mean, it generally feels like there's there's sort of enough material here for an entire series, but they um, they just oh, crammed. Yeah. They just, I think I think I mean this was also the final um, story in the in the cartoon in that series of cartoons, and then, and then yeah. it was over in the US cartoon, yeah. And it ended on a strange note, which seemed to be kind of Galvatron and Lord Zarak having this like bickering odd couple relationship. <laughs> and, then, and then it was like and Cybertron's now made of gold and then it's like that's your lot there's no more Transformers <laughs> we're done now uh, yeah it was very weird the way it kind of just ended like that another weird thing I thought they, they very much set up Fortress Max- Maximus or Cerebros as a, a, you know very much like a peacenik almost like a conscientious objector that's his character mm. but then at the end it's a new age of peace Cybertron's now gold and Prime sort of has a session with Fort Max or Cerebros and just says now your job is to go back to Nebulos and destroy the evil machines <laughs> um, and, and, and he's like this is amazing Prime this is a miracle when the last of the hive's evil is wiped out you shall live here in peace as this world's guardian thank you Optimus Prime it's a miracle <laughs> If you use the word miracle, I thought, that was just the exact opposite to what you, you always wanted, and I don't understand exactly. your motivation at all now. Yeah, but th- and again, that kind of happens in the comics as well, because mm. Fortress Max starts as desperately wanting peace, and ends up travelling to Earth to have more fights. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's sort of, I mean, I guess he, he um, he's, yeah, he, he never really gets back on that. I suppose he's no. I mean, he sort of learns that he can't really, he can't really abdicate his his responsibilities. Maybe, and he's also sort of a different person by that point because he's now the combination of him and yeah. Galen and later Spike. <laughs> My optics. So yeah, rebirth. Yeah, it just seems very rushed. But Japan instead made a whole ridiculous number of episode series about the whole thing. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which Dave's watched a lot, lot of. I managed to get myself through... I've had this on DVD since it was released about 10 years ago, maybe, on DVD. Mm-hmm. And I've never managed to get all the way through Headmasters. Really? Wow. I've watched the first... <laughs> Maybe five to ten episodes. I rewatched the first four or five recently, mm-hmm. and oh, it's such heavy going. It's such hard work. <laughs> it's um, it's the dub that does it. It's the it's no. I'm not watching the dub though. I'm watching it with the subs. Oh, well, then, see, you're not watching it right. Then <laughs> it's <laughs> well, I watched the dub for a bit until I got really <laughs> sick of it because the, the subs are just as bad. Like some things are not the, tr- the translation is not perfect. And the dubs is just as bad, but it's more hilarious because someone is saying this, saying this madness. Yeah. They all have weird new names that don't make any sense. It's just... Yeah. I, I read something about this. Apparently they are professional dubbers who like have dubbed like Godzilla films and so on. But it it's very clear from the dub that they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> They barely know anything about Transformers, <laughs> and they've just kind of gone, oh, well, uh, this is roughly what they're saying. This'll do. This will do. We'll call him Billy. <laughs> Why not? But apart from that, how far did you get? How, what, what was the last episode you saw? I got to the point where the Battle Beast turned up, turned up and I thought, nah, uh, nah, that's enough. Right. <laughs> um, Michael, do you remember the toy line, the, ba- the toy line Battle Beasts? What was it? Was it? Were they pretenders that took, were like wolves and things? No, was they were. Else? They were a separate toy line. I think oh. oh, oh, yes, of course, the firewood and water guys. Yeah, those mm. guys. I've got a few of those. <laughs> yeah, so they somewhere in a box. They're in headmasters. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm actually. My mind is blown by this revelation, <laughs> um, and I don't see how those things fit together at all. But um, I, I also, I mean, I'm kind of glad in a way because I love the battle beasts. Yeah. 
a great collectible range. Was that a Hasbro toy then? It, it, well, it must have been at least a Takara toy. Yeah, license would be licensed out. It's to hard another... to say whether the licensing was the same. Yeah. It probably was. It's possible it was a Hasbro toy. Beast Formers was a Japanese toy line produced by Takara in 1986, a year before the Headmaster series, and they were marketed as a spin-off of Transformers. Hasbro later licensed the property for sale in the US, but as an entirely separate entity to Transformers, known as Battle Beasts. The two-inch action figures were anthropomorphized animals with body armour and unique weapons. Much like the rub signs found on many G1 Transformers, the beasts each had a heat-sensitive sticker that revealed a fire, wood or water symbol, intending to be used to battle them in a paper-scissors-stone fashion. But yeah, like in the Japanese TV series, they just get this kind of mm-hmm. distress call. They're out in space. Oh no, they, they're, they're out in space and... Um, Two of the battle beasts just turn up <laughs> um, in exosuits, in um, in Spike and Daniel exosuits, for some reason. Oh, but what? What's are they human scale? Yeah. Yes, they are human scale. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then they have to go there and help them out and solve a problem. Now I don't know what that problem is because I stopped <laughs> watching that episode because I got <laughs> so tired of it. But it's it's a strange series because it's there's loads of battles in it. Which are really quite good, mm. quite well. It's well animated, but um, it's big battle, and then five to ten minutes of exposition with lots of people just stood in a room talking at each other, and then another big battle. I mean, I think that's that's quite an anime sort of vibe, isn't it? I think where you've got like sort mm. of action scenes and and, co- and exposition conversation scenes. It's probably kind of we'll spend all the money on the battle scenes, and then we'll just have two people statically t- talking mm-hmm. to each other. That's what happens a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Save, save the animator's wrists. <laughs> it's um, it's interesting because the the twist that the Japanese um, show does is like continue, just like just ignore rebirth and just continue straight on from the movie. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, as far as they're concerned, rebirth rebirth is not continuity as far as Japan's concerned. So does the does the movie fit in the Japanese continuity? Yes. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, because the Japanese continuity is the same. I mean, obviously it has um, it's it's dubbed differently. Yeah. So there's there's differences, but it's all it's the same all the way up until the end of season the season before Rebirth, anyway. Oh, really? So then it sort of divides off, and they did a, they did a really long series with all these new guys yeah. plus Battle Beasts, and then the the American one just ended. I assume it's just to do with how well the toy range was doing in the respective places. Pretty much. A combination of declining sales and viewership in the US led to season 4 being truncated to just three episodes and wrapping up the show in the West. However, Transformers continued to go strong in Japan which led to a further three full-length seasons of Japanese G1. Indeed, originally season 4 was supposed to be a five-part series finale, but budget cutbacks reduced it to three, which rather explains why it hurtles along at such breakneck speed. So the the difference between the headmasters in the Japanese series, they were little robots who didn't know how to transform, mm-hmm. and then they travelled to Nebulos, and because Nebulos had such terrible weather, yeah, it was weather related. <laughs> they decided they need to buy needed to build bigger bodies to protect themselves from the harsh environment, and then they learnt to turn into heads and shout, was, "Head uh, on!" It's not called. Neb- they don't go to Nebulon. Oh no, it's called the Planet Master. Ma- that's Planet, it, Master. Planet Master. Oh yeah, that's where they get the um, where it carries on in the other the other shows, isn't it? Yeah, where because they, they use the they use the Master tech. Force. Yeah, tech in Super God Master Force. Yeah, they're, it's it's weird. So yeah, the little guys are the actual guys. So you've not got any of that kind of like who's in charge kind of situation yeah. going on. I, th- I think they they tried to put, and I think this was kind of the case in the cartoon and the comic that they had this idea that. You know, they, they they become somehow more powerful from being like two beings working together. Yes. Sort of greater than the sum of its parts. And that's why the Decepticons have to do it, because they have to like catch up. Yeah, for some reason in the comics, it's it's just kind of explained as, oh, they seem to be able to shoot better than they could before. Yeah. <laughs> how, how were they shooting before? <laughs> <laughs> really badly. They were awful before. They couldn't hit any, yeah, they're, anybody. They're robots. <laughs> you think, they, they think that would be an easy thing to program. Like, we can make robots now that can do that. Yeah, but no, they were just terrible shots. And then as soon as they became headmasters, they got much better. So they didn't They didn't have the, um, the readout in the comics? No, they didn't bother with no, that in the comic. Because like no. they didn't do that in the... 
American side of the cartoon either. It was just on the Japanese side, right? No. Obviously, it was a toy thing, but no, it wasn't. Mm. Um, but they had a similar kind of, like what, what Michael was talking about, how they became more kind of powerful. They had a similar thing in Headmasters, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they, would, um, they could swap heads. They would swap their heads and then become more powerful because they swapped heads. Yeah, or just want to change their abilities somehow or something like that. You would think so. <laughs> they all had special powers. Uh, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> Depended on the episode, yeah. <laughs> I always found it weird, very weird that for some reason, Mind Wipe could hypnotise people. I, mean, yep. I guess it was like... <laughs> Here he is. He can hypnotise people because he's a bat. Because he's a bat. Because of Dracula, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, it Dracula. Was... Yeah, a vampire. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Something else I noticed: the gorilla guy, whose name escapes me, Ape Face, had, had a Mex in the cartoon had a Mexican accent. Just thought I'd flag that. Really? Did he? <laughs> <laughs> I miss that. Uh, we'll see who's boss. I don't. I have nothing else to say about it. It just struck me as bizarre. My optics. I really liked how Fortress Maximus in the Japanese cartoon got the the sword, and like. That's the other thing in the show. Him and Scorponok don't actually transform into their big mega forms until like halfway through the season. Scorponok is always is just the little guy for the majority of the time trying to take over the Decepticons and Mega Zarak. Me- well, before he becomes Mega, he's just oh, of course, sorry, little. yes, so, yeah, <laughs> Zarak. To Zarak, yeah, he's just in the shadows for like the first few episodes, just pretending that no one knows who he is, but we can all clearly tell who he is. Mm-hmm. But I like that. Um, like Fortress Maximus n- needed the sword to do it. He, well, he had to use the sword to become his giant version. Yeah, he needed to like a proper, like a very Japanese, almost kind of transformation sequence, almost kind of He Man like. Exactly like He Man. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I found comical about that final episode I watched, the one with the uh, battle beasts or whatever oh, yeah. they're called in the Japanese version, is that. Um, when uh, Fortress Maximus is the spaceship, mm-hmm. Cerebros hangs around on the bridge of that spaceship in head form. Yes. <laughs> so they sat, sat on like a plinth. <laughs> and I, all the other um, Autobot headmasters are in there, like in robot form, talking to him. <laughs> and he's just there in head form, just having a chat with them while he's it's controlling the whole spaceship. <laughs> you think he'd be somewhat less use in that form. Yeah, you'd think he'd just... Be in robot form, <laughs> sat in like a captain's chair or something. But no, he's in head form on a plinth. Fine. It's, um, it's okay. Because in the the Hasbro, the American version, he he does have like another alt mode. You see once, like he's like a little table with radar dishes on it or something. He, he, he transforms into something else before you see him transform really? into the head later on. He has a sort of vehicle mode, which is I, I mean, he kind of has. It's meant to be like a tr- sort of like a big tank or something. But it's basically, it's just him, like, it's pretty much just him lying down. Yeah, like with a lot of those <laughs> city formers. Like in the comics, you either never see Fortress Maximus' city mode and Scorponok's city mode, or you see it very rarely. They don't really refer to it. Scorponok turns into the Scorpion all the time. Right. Yeah, constantly. But you don't see any um, any city modes for either of them in the in the In the book. cartoon, the American cartoon, they, they both, there was a sort of... There was some reference to this in that, like, they made the two Scorpionok and Fortress Maximus out of, out of bits of the city on, on Nebulas yeah. or something mm. like that. And they were kind of like, they did sort of refer to it as being like a city or being like a... Because it's funny, this idea of them being cities, because they're not very big. <laughs> no, I always assumed that they were... I think it's more like a base. That's how I would think of it. <laughs> yeah, I always assumed that maybe they kind of plugged into the city. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you've plugged into Waterbot City and you were maybe the, the command centre of the place, but not the whole thing. That's what Metroplex does. He plugs into Waterbot City. Yeah. There you yeah. go. That's probably where that's probably where I got the idea, for, where, where that idea cemented yeah. in my I mean, mind. Because, yeah, Metroplex... I think that, there was yeah. a, one of the UK comics where Metroplex came up and he was he was sort of buried underneath Waterbot City. He was like... Sort of, but he was he was absolutely mm. enormous. Like He was much bigger <laughs> than anything I've seen before in, in that comic. Yes. He's one of the few ones in the comics which, who are actually massive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because like Scorponok and Fort Max, as you say, are just like a little bit bigger. They're maybe like a head taller than the other headmasters. Yeah, but like Metroplex is genuinely enormous. Yeah, gigantic. Is, is um is a uh, Triptychon big as well? Then in the comics, he's quite big, but he's not mm. that big. 
he's, yeah. he's big. Yeah, I can't I can't remember how big he is, but I don't think he's you know he's not. I can I can picture it in my mind now. There's a there's a particular panel of Metroplex when he transforms, and he is absolutely gigantic hmm. in the comic book. But I don't think there was anything like that with Trypticon. No, he was bigger than he was a big guy, but like yeah, he wasn't um, he wasn't a giant. No, I don't think so. Anyway, that's interesting though. Like, I wonder why they did it that way round, because the toys were a lot smaller. Like Metroplex and uh, uh, Trypticon were not massive. I mean, Trypticon. Yeah. Well, they, they were, were big for the. They were big was, at the time. Yeah, he, Metroplex was the biggest one they'd made when when it was really? released as a toy. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So, so it was always sort of like he was meant to be a really big transformer, but then you know they just upped the stakes a bit with the. With, with a few of the following ones. Yeah, uh, there was no one near his size when he came out. He was considered massive. Uh, yeah. I suppose I suppose the closest you had were people like... Well, Jetfire was quite big. Blaster was bizarrely quite big. But, like, no one was as big as Metroplex at the time. Okay. Hmm. My the toys. I didn't have any headmasters when I was a kid. I don't think, um... I was really into it at the time when the Headmasters came out. I think I, I had a lot of kind of early G1 stuff, but I kind of missed out on the Headmasters. Was it, I don't know, but did you, did you see it though? Was it on the shelves and everything? Did you? I seem to remember it being out, but I think at the time, maybe I was just going through a bit of a, a low interest point with uh, Transformers toys, I think. I was probably into something else at the time, like G.I. Joe or Starcom or something. All right, okay. There was a lot of things competing for my attention on the toy shelves. <laughs> mm. So I was picking up other stuff. So I don't, re- I, don't, I don't think I ever had a headmaster. I knew kids who had them. Mm. My brother had a couple of target masters, but I didn't have any headmasters. But I did, I did tease that um, we had a particular reason for inviting Michael onto this one. Would you like to tell everybody why we've invited you on, Michael? Uh, yes, when I was, I'm pretty sure, eight years old, I won um, a colouring competition in my local toy shop, and I won the Fortress Maximus toy. Wow. Which I still have. <laughs> yes. Yes, I've, I've seen it. I, I remember um, going to Glastonbury one year and us getting stranded in London and having to sleep over... Oh, I remember. Yeah, it. to sleep over in your room for some reason, because uh, I think yep. uh, the hire car broke down and we had to sleep over at your house. And... Um, it was just there in a cupboard. Um, <laughs> it was like, wow. And it's the first time I'd ever seen that toy. I've always heard about it. Yeah, well, of course, it wasn't released in the UK. I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about that, right? You're, you, are, you are pretty much correct. Um, it was given away in some colouring competitions, and it was given away at Hamley's, possibly in a colouring competition or possibly part of a um, guess who competition where they had some silhouettes of transformers where you had to guess who they were and then yeah. put into a lot uh, a hat and drawn out but um yeah there was some there were some rumors that it did kind of surface in a couple of shops yeah, in like it's... places but that this could be just it's people... always very hard to track yeah i mean what you could get like what you could get like I don't think anyone was ever really completely sure what was available. Yeah. And you you sometimes hear someone at school would say, like, oh, my friend got Swoop, mm. which was, I'm pretty sure, not available in the UK for yes. some reason. I feel, I feel like we got about 80% of what you could get in the States. So like, we, we were just sometimes they'd just be like, nope, no blaster for you. <laughs> and you just never see him. You'd never see a blaster. It's nice to see things have changed very, very much over the years. <laughs> sometimes someone would have it. And maybe their parents got it from America or something, but you were never really sure what was going on. And I think the catalogues had all of them, so... Yeah, and this is why um, in the UK, the UK-only storylines in the comic book, Fort Max is nowhere to be seen early on, because it's like, he's not right. going to be coming out. That's right, <laughs> That's right. he's not in it. <laughs> he's only in the backup strip, which is from the American comic. Yeah, exactly. But that must have been amazing, winning, winning Fort Max. Well, yeah, I mean, here's, here's roughly the story, is that... There was in there was a local toy shop in Palmer's Green where I grew up, and I think it was a toy master. I think Toy Master must have been a franchise. It, it um, was sort of, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. It was. A, I think it was a Toy Master affiliated shop, and yeah, one day they just had this giant Transformer Fortress Maximus in the window, and you know, apparently everyone at school was was kind of obsessed with it. Or at least all the boys were, and we'd all go down and look at it in the window and be like, "Should we go and look at it again?" <laughs> and, um, and and then. 
and I think the competition was it was a picture of him. Um, I assume it was. I think they just traced over some promotional artwork. Yeah, I've seen it. And yeah. done an outline version, and then. I mean, I think they also had a rule that they said, they said something very specifically like age is not, it's sort of like we'll take age into account. It's an all ages competition. So, you know, if you're a really young kid and you don't go in the lines all the time, we'll, we'll like cut, cut you a break. Mm-hmm. But then, so, and, and I think a lot of my friends submitted like, you know, 30 entries. Cause you could do it as many times as you wanted. <laughs> really? And that was also part of the rules. Yeah, yeah, you didn't have, you could have, that was, they actually said that. They were like, you can do as many as you like. Okay. But I think they were also like, probably if you do that, we'll just take your best one. Yeah, I guess they, I guess um, they'd noticed that the same name was appearing on all of these <laughs> things, yeah. But what happened was someone, I, I'm pretty sure it was a friend of my mum's who was an art teacher, sort of took me aside and said, do you know what's going to win this competition? Is It'd be like it's got a blank background. If you draw a background, that will stand out because everyone can colour in. It doesn't matter. Like, anyone can do that. <laughs> wow. Um, so what, and I was like, hmm, that's a good idea, but I'm eight, so I can't really draw. <laughs> so I just drew um, a grid, you know, like we had on the old packaging. Oh, yeah. And I think I did it in like fluorescent highlighter. I filled in the squares in black. It looked very striking. And I submitted a couple like that, I think. One with, one in the standard colours. Wow. That was sort of something close to his real colours and one that was a kind of mad fluorescent version. And then when, when the, then I, you know, sort of probably didn't think too much more of it because I was like, well, I'm not going to win. No, only one person can win this. Why would I win? Like everybody's trying to win it. And then I, I got out of school one day and my mum and my brother were there at the school gates and they said, you've won the competition. <laughs> and I was sort of like, I think my reaction was like, this had better not be a wind up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I did, I, I did win. <laughs> and then when, when I went to the toy shop to collect it, uh, there was a rep from Hasbro and he, he said that the runners up, I think they just had some other Transformers, you know, some other biggish Transformers you can win for the two runner up prizes. Um, they, the runners up were really hard to pick, but yours was the clear, uh, winner. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, yeah, no, it was because of the background. <laughs> Must have been. <laughs> well, that's, that's very, very astute of that, uh, was it, you used to say a friend of your mother's? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's. I mean, that's the stuff of dreams. Like, yeah, because at the time, at the time, I mean, Fortress Maximus was like this amazing thing that no one could get hold of, no one had ever seen. <laughs> it was just like it's the biggest Transformer ever, and no one can get hold of one in the was, UK. They were impossible to hmm, get, and I think it was about four hundred dollars in the states in like nineteen eighty seven, wow. so nineteen eighty eight. <laughs> so it was like it was a it was it was a hundred dollars, but I suppose it's oh, was cl- it? closer to four by depreciation. Uh, okay. It's about four hundred dollars, or yeah, sorry, inflation or whatever. It's sort of probably even. It's kind of like even if it had been available here, I don't know if I would have ended up with one because it was an expensive toy. Yeah, and it would have been more expensive here anyway because prices yeah, always, from yeah. Yeah, always, always more expensive here than in America. Mm. But it was like, it was the biggest Transformer ever released. And it was, well, within G1. And it was kind of amazing. Kind of similar kind of status to um, G.I. Joe's USS Flag, that giant... Was it an aircraft carrier or something they did? Yeah, yeah. an aircraft carrier. It's basically, it's, 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 it's very big. It's massive. <laughs> It's like we're going to make an unreasonably big toy and release it in this range. It's like a kind of almost probably as a publicity stunt. Yeah, we won't necessarily even make that many. It was Hasbro showing off. It was just going, look, look, yeah. what, look what we can make and we can sell. We can get away with yeah. selling this. But yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, uh, and and it's good to know you still got it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I actually went, I was at my parents' house a few weeks ago and I transformed him mm-hmm. um, into his base mode. Not, I didn't bother with the vehicle mode. Yeah, mm. and I was I was a little nervous um, with some of the joints, but he was still up to it. He's a very chunky guy, you know. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's quite well made actually. He's got a bit of die cast on him, mm-hmm. not not loads, but um, yeah, it's, I th- I've got, still got most of the parts. I think there's one or two little guns missing. Yeah, he sent a few photos through and a little video of you yeah. shooting the car down the ramp. He's also very yellow. <laughs> he's yeah, he's he has he's yellow. Very yellow, and I I put it down to it. I think it would have happened a bit, but I think it's probably to do with him spending the first couple of months of his life in a toy shop window absolutely mm. i would have thought so that's it, you know it all gets stored up and then uh turns yellow over time and there's not much you can do about it no no but um yeah no amazing i mean what i was, I was gonna say uh, michael i just can't understand how 
like you don't constantly wear a badge or a t-shirt saying that you won this thing for like your entire life. Like, yeah, I still talk <laughs> about it quite a lot. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> why would you not? I mean, <laughs> I think you know, in, in a way, it's 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 probably like the one time. You know, it's it's like it's like a magic moment where I actually got like the big prize. It might it might be like, <laughs> you know, every, every kid in in the neighborhood wanted this. Everyone wanted mm. it, and apparently someone, the toy shop guy who my mum kind of knew a bit, kind of said um, apparently someone offered him like a thousand pounds for it or something like this. But he, he obviously wow. couldn't he couldn't do that because it was actually probably owned by Hasbro, I assume. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Yeah, I do still dine out on this quite a lot. If any, if anyone's willing to listen, like I will tell the tale. <laughs> it's, amazing. it's amazing. It's amazing story. Um, the the, co- the colouring entry though, I don't have it. Did they not get it? You keep it? No, they kept it. All right, because it might Ooh. be in an archive somewhere in Hasbro to this day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I've seen I've seen some other entries online. Some people did get to keep their entries and have like posted them. Yeah, I think we asked to keep it, and they said no. All oh, right. Okay. Maybe they want. Maybe because you were the winner, they wanted to. Uh, maybe they were thinking of publishing it somewhere or something. In the, maybe in the back page maybe of the comic in a trade or something. Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But I mean, it was it was it, it was an amazing toy and a very interesting toy. Yeah, especially well, with the the double headmaster aspect is. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a unique aspect. Actually, I assume there wasn't ever another double headmaster. Not until much later. Not until they yeah. started basically doing the same thing again in many in later of years. Of course, yeah, and I'm sure there's been like redos of it and by now. Yeah, like what Dave was showing you earlier was. Uh, oh yeah, he's a double headmaster now. Yeah, With the new one, the new Scorpion. Yes, these are the Titan Master headmasters. Yeah, they look pretty tidy, actually. I would say, but they they both transform into robots then with robots for heads. At this point, Virtual Dave is brandishing the head of both Titans Returns Fortress Maximus and Earthrise Scorponok, the latest updates of both characters. Both are done in a very G1 faithful fashion. However, this time Scorponok is closer to Fortress Maximus in size and height and shares the double headmaster gimmick, or Titan Master as they're called these days. So they've done it since, but at the time that was the first time. And it's also the first time I read this... I read this the other day, and I, 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 I suppose it's true, it just hadn't really occurred to me. It's the first time a human appeared in the Transformers toy line. Oh, right. That's a good point. A human? Because of Spike. Because uh, sp- Spike's a human. Yeah, there was never, a, there was never like oh. a Spike toy or anything. I see. Spike or Spark Plug. They were just in the cartoon. Yeah. So is it the first human figure in the, to- in the toy line? Yeah, because the others were Nebulons. Yeah. Yep. All of them, I think. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think maybe that even occurred to me at the time. I was like, oh, it's funny having Spike here in this context. Mm. <laughs> I always thought it was amazing that Spike was his headmaster. It like, really tied it all together because yeah. Spike, he'd been in the TV series from the very beginning. He'd been in the comic from very, very early on. I mean, he had his, was it his brother or his... Yeah, Buster. Buster. Mm-hmm. But then you moved on to Spike fairly quickly. So you had this character who started off as like a teenager in the show and now he's the headmaster of the biggest Transformer mm. ever. Yeah. It was kind of a very kind of like interesting ascension. Um, so I really like that about it. I think there's a bit in the comic where it's Spike is sort of keeping Fort Max in like a garage somewhere and he's like <laughs> kind of given up. He's hung up his headmaster armour and he's like trying to have a normal life. Yeah, there is. Yeah, he's just basically sick of it, That's isn't he? They all get sick of it in the end. <laughs> Fuck Transformers. Oh, fuck, I've, I've had enough of these fuckers. I'm not yeah. fighting in your stupid war anymore. Yeah, it's really understandable. But now I think Galvatron turns up and he has to kick, pick up the pick up the old the old armor again and yeah, sort things out. The way you say it, it's like I picture that that shot of Spider Man in his suit in the bin, and he's walking down the alleyway in the rain. Like I just picture Fort Max hanging outside of the yes. bin. Yes, yeah, yeah. As he's the... walking away from there. <laughs> <laughs> It very much is. It very much is a mirror of that storyline. It just you know gives up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean that was the Fort Max. Fort Max was sick of it to start with, and that, that's kind of his character, really, isn't it? He's like. Yeah. He's sort of like. He's also just the smart guy in the room who's like, if we've been fighting this war for millions of years, it's probably just going to go on for another millions of years. <laughs> and like, it's stupid. This is stupid. <laughs> like, I don't want to be have anything to do with it anymore. <laughs> So yeah, so let's let's talk about headmasters, 
post G1. Headmasters actually had a huge influence on the franchise, not just with like the Nebulons that appeared, you know, the whole kind of master mm-hmm. gimmick that appeared in the rest of the G1 line, for instance, Target Masters and uh, Power Masters and uh, etc. But there have been Headmasters after afterwards. For example, Fortress Maximus got reissued in the Robots in Disguise line. <laughs> yeah. And he had Headmaster. Was it um, Brave Maximus or something was it called? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Robots in Disguise was just a line where it was just loads of toys from old old toy lines kind of thrown in. There were new ones, but there were lots of like recolors of G1 stuff, etc., etc. Right. Mm-hmm. So they did bring out Fortress, Fortress Maximus again in some like brighter colors, and he obviously was a headmaster. Was it the same toy? It was the same toy. Yeah, it was the G1 mm-hmm. toy. They recut recolored? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it had like a bright green block on his shoulder and... Oh, okay. Yeah, I may even have seen this, but it all gets quite confusing for me. But another thing they did there was um, they released a figure that was supposed to be in the Beast Machines line called um, Megatron Megabolt. Oh, yes. And he was basically like a little kind of... He had little spider legs. He was like a head with spider legs. And it wasn't originally intended, but they basically uh, retconned him so that he was able to double up as a an, as an extra head for um for Fortress Maximus and he did fit right. which is quite cool but that that toy was meant to be out in the beast machines line but because beast machines flopped <laughs> it never got released it's interesting though because that because that heads in the show it's, it's the massive head cathedral yeah it's has. called the uh, it's called the grand mall it's yeah. the uh, it's megatron's vessel stroke body throughout the entire second season of Beast Machines. But I think by that point, the writing was on the wall for Beast Machines. It was like, no one likes this. Oh, no, no. I just mean in the terms of, like, it kind of works in the head as a scale, because that was a massive head floating around, so it could have possibly fit. Yes, it was a gi- it was a gigantic head that just loomed over <laughs> Cybertron. Yeah. It was basically like a massive flying head. Yeah. For some reason. It never really explained why. But it was like Megatron's base of operations. Uh, this is Beast, Beast Wars Megatron. Right, Beast Wars Megatron. Who's not Megatron, is my understanding. No, he's basically a, such a big fan of Megatron that he named himself Megatron. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are you called Megatron? Well, because I thought G1 Megatron was so cool. <laughs> yeah. in, Unicron, in the Unicron trilogy, there was a couple, I think. Sideways? Yes, yeah, Sideways, who had like a little mini con that turned into a head with his legs hanging in the air. <laughs> so, were these reason. just uh, smaller Transformers, though? They weren't like humans or, or anything? No, they were smaller robots, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. in the Unicron trilogy, the first, the first part of it, which was called um, uh, Armada, it was all based around what were basically Micromasters and. You attach the MicroMaster to the toy and it activated some kind of gimmick. Okay. So this it is a bit like the sort of Nebulon's Power Masters, Headmaster's yeah. idea. That they will have like a little guy that does something to them. Yeah, and it, yeah. Even, even the Power Masters in G1, they activated the transformation on the toys. You yeah, couldn't transform them. Yeah, just gave you a really great way to break it when you Exa- were <laughs> Don't. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> Dave has my Power Master um, Optimus Prime because I mm-hmm. was going to sell it and I was transforming it back to... Yeah. I mean, I had that one and it was very, very scary to transform even at the time. Yeah, I was transforming it back to truck mode and I'd forgotten because I hadn't done it in so long. <laughs> I'd forgotten that I needed to push the Power Master in to transform it. You can just press... You can just hold it. Yeah, but I'd forgotten that. So I, I, I forced it and broke it. Yeah, but I mean, even if you were doing it properly, it was still quite possible to break mm. it, I would say. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it upset me so much that I just gave it away. <laughs> I was like, I can't even look at this anymore. And, I, and I'd, I'd, not, I'd not known Dave for very long, and I was like, do you want this? Because I, I just can't, I can't stand to have it in my house anymore. It, it angers me so much. Um, so, and then there was also Overload, which is a big red thing. Oh, um, yeah. and yeah. Omega Supreme Omega, the, uh, the Omega Supreme for the Unicorn Trilogy had a headmaster as well uh, mm-hmm. 
And the only other thing to cover before I uh, we talk about Titans Returns is animated. Uh, Transformers animated had a. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the um. The, go on. He, I can't remember what his name was, but he was just like this nerdy guy who saw these Transformers and didn't like them for some some reason, and he wanted to take over them, and he made a device that would cut their heads off, and he would clamp onto them and take control of their bodies by force. Yeah. He would just keep hopping to different people. Oh. <laughs> yeah. His name was Henry Masterson. That's it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he was like a, a crazy scientist guy. <laughs> and yeah, he created the Headmaster Unit, which was basically like a little robot that he piloted. <laughs> oh, you could walk as well. <laughs> yeah, he could walk. And, he could tra- and then he'd transform into a head and cut the head of another Transformer off and take control. And he, when he took control, little screws screwed him on. <laughs> this came down on the side and screwed him onto the top of the head. So with, with any headmaster concept, you've always got to find a weird excuse to get the head off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Here's another so one. So he had like a laser that would just... And he could fly it as well. He could fly the head around. It had like jets on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, and then apparently there's a headmaster in the last night, but I don't care. Oh, it's... It- that is um, what is then Cogman? Yeah, it, mm. it's not the worst thing in that film. Let's put it that way. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen it, but I, as I understand it, there's some pretty bad stuff in that movie. Oh, it's the worst of them all. It's the worst of them all. This is <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah. My optics. I'm going to Dave. I'm going to let you explain. Titan, was it Return? What? Titans Return. Titans Return. That's it. Yeah. Um, well, it was the second part of the Prime Wars trilogy by Machinima. Uh, it's what almost four or five years ago now. Wow. The show itself was, uh, it was bad, <laughs> but but it was it was. I mean, the first part, um, Combiner Wars, was already pretty terrible. Um, but the second part, they made they they hyped it up as it being, we we listen to you, we listen to the fans, so we're going to change things up. We got they got Peter Cullen back. They got um, oh, the hot the guy who does Hot Rod's voice. What's his name? Um, Judd. Um, Judd Nelson. Well, they actually yeah, Judd got Nelson. Judd Nelson. Judd Nelson came back. Uh, they got Tommy from Power Rangers. <laughs> to be uh, okay to be to be spike fine basically he's, yeah <laughs> there were all these famous names to come in and just like yeah we're, 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 it's gonna be great don't worry about it this this is gonna be the the new stepping stone in the transformers history and it wasn't uh, it wasn't it, it, <laughs> i mean it so to get a little bit of background the 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 whole prime wars trilogy was a youtube thing wasn't it oh it was yeah so it was broadcast on youtube well, not broadcast but it was made for youtube yeah yeah no, i didn't know yeah. that so i mean it's not like it's not got nearly the same production values as the stuff we're now seeing on netflix it's yeah. a lot that, does um, it fit into the old continuity or is it like a do-over it's a do-over yeah uh, it's because i actually I, I did re-watch some of it um in lead up to this, and I forgot that they do talk a lot about the stuff that happens in Generation 1, and the one thing I do like in the show is Megatron, and he does talk to Prime um, like a real person uh, mm-hmm. in the show, and is like... They, ha- they have jokes. They actually, Megatron's actually really funny in the show, and he jokes about um, don't make me kill you again, Prime, or something like that. And he's, yeah. he, there's a lot of hints to him becoming Galvatron. So they're making references back to Megatron. Almost kind of, you know, again, kind of almost breaking the fourth wall and making references to previous Transformers series. Yeah. yeah. Hinting <laughs> that maybe the original continuity all happened and we're now just sort of going through it all again. Yeah. He's probably the highlight of the show, but the actual headmasters in the show, there's only, there's only Titan one. Masters, there's a... Tit- Titan Master. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just Fortress Maximus. Yeah. Um... None of the others turn up. Really? Which was was a bit disappointing. Yeah, none of the others are in it. No no highbrow? <laughs> no, no. Because the entire toy line was full of headmasters. 
Everyone was a headmaster. Yeah, like every, including Prime. Like, everybody had a head... Everybody, everyone, if anyone in that line was a headmaster and all the Voyagers were triple changes as well for no reason. Yeah. And sometimes <laughs> you had... Sometimes you couldn't you buy Titan Masters separately? Yeah, you could buy some with, like, their own little... Almost, Vehicles. Uh, yeah, almost like so you could fulfill the... Target master element as well because they could become little guns. Uh-huh. So you would get both. And so you, you could, could you could match. You could buy the headmasters separately, and then you could attach mm-hmm. them to whatever robot you wanted. Oh. Any robot in the line, yeah. Okay, I mean, sounds pretty good. I have to say. Yeah, it was quite a good a good plan. And sometimes they would they bring a toy out with a particular head on, and then you'd mm-hmm. there'd be other heads available that probably suited the toy a bit better. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They did that. I mean, the, don't get me wrong. The toy line is brilliant. It's the thing I love about mm. um, the whole Prime Wars trilogy. That part is probably the my, my most favoured of them all. But it's just the the show is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they even have Mark Hamill in it as um, Megatronus. Really? And he's the one who he kills Prime. I mean, spoilers. Uh, Prime dies. I think Prime always dies, doesn't he? I mean, that's, that's his character. <laughs> actually, that was something I was going to mention, actually, uh, earlier. In the Transformers Headmasters, the Japanese series, they pretty much do the death of Prime again. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just go, I know it happened in the movie, and I know Hot Rod took over as Rodimus Prime, but we're going to do it again. <laughs> so Hot Rod becomes Rodimus Prime again. Mm-hmm. They the two primes get to fight someone together and then Optimus immediately dies. <laughs> right. Just because they want to they wanted to have two primes on screen. They've, I think I think the episode's even called Double Convoy or something. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So, so Optimus dies again in Titan Masters. But Titan Masters... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Re- Re- Return of the Titans? Uh, what is it called? Titans, Titans Return. Re- Titans Return, yeah. In Titans Return, that's when we get our first Titan class toy isn't it well apart from obviously from combiner wars we had a combiner like a like we had oh, yeah, devastator the, um, devastator yeah but that's when we get metroplex isn't it yeah it's the, the well, if anything the prime wars trilogy is not really about prime mm-hmm. it's more about uh wing blade like they yeah. i guess it's it's really more tied into the ID, idw comics at the time mm-hmm. where wing blade is the city speaker yeah and she can communicate with these titans and at the end of the Combiner Wars, Metroplex has woken up, and oh, so Metroplex was a com- was Metroplex a Combiner Wars toy? He was a generation toy. He was before, but oh. they just wiggled him into the series. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah. Yes, I remember. He um he comes he comes into it in Titans Return, and Starscream, Starscream's ghost takes over the body of Trypticon because Megatronus wants him to take over it and just create havoc because reasons. Uh, yes. But again, they're kind of a uh, harking back to G one yeah. storyline things like Starscream's ghost. It feels like the kind of madness that went on in the comics, actually, in the Marvel comics. Yeah, absolutely. Like there was a time when Scar- Starscream got really, really big, and he like killed like half the Transformers. Underbase, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. That's what he. That's what Starscream does. He, he in Combiner Wars, he he takes the thing that makes Combiners, and he uses it to make himself a massive combiner with other combiners. Um, so a combiner combiner? A combiner combiner. <laughs> so what, like, one of his legs is Devastator, yep. and the other leg is, uh, I don't know, um, Ruination, or whatever we want to call him, um, Superion as one arm. Like, mm-hmm. what? what? Yeah, okay. It, I mean, in concept, it, it does sound like a very crazy Power Rangers idea, but... It does. The show, they didn't really play with it much. He, he just does that for... A, Half an episode, and he becomes a giant Starscream head and starts yelling lasers at people. Is, I mean, the toy line was good. That's that's. Just... <laughs> yeah, I think what I'm getting from this is that the TV show or the YouTube show was not great. <laughs> it was a bit better than the one before. Yes, yes. Yeah. It had some slightly better voice acting, ish, ish. But the toy line was where you were uh, you were on board, mm-hmm. and they are quite nice. And I do like. I did. I did think that the whole kind of play idea of being able to buy separate heads and being able to switch the heads out and be, the whole idea of that whole head switching, which was kind of part of the original G1 headmasters, but it was never really played upon. It I mean, al- you had... Go on. I was going to say, it was also the last 
like big thing that the between you know, the the split between Hasbro and Takara toys of always having a different paint job and better more show accurate decos. The Titans Return line had the Takara Legends and those had proper show accurate decos of them from G one and um well the comic books as well I suppose is that they all look better in that line. Yeah. And that was the other I mean because uh, there were there were differences in design between the Japanese and the and the U- U.S. shows anyway, like so. Yeah, they're probably yeah. doing a bit of that as well, which is what's quite nice about that Scorponok because you've got the double headmaster. The is it one of the headmasters looks like Zarak from the toy, and one looks like Zarak from the TV show. Like they're different. Yeah, yeah, that's what they're both. They could transform into both of them. Yeah, so it's quite nice. Quite a nice little nod. My so. Dave, you have a question you wanted to ask. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, to find out which is your favourite headmaster, if any, or just design-wise or character. Good guy, bad guy. I mean, I think they're, they're pretty zany designs. I quite like I quite like how the Decepticons are all beasts and mm. the and yeah, like. That's quite cool. And also you've got... Isn't there a bit in the cartoon where they, they're talking about making headmasters and he goes like, just the animals. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's <laughs> ominous like that. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? I think it's Cyclonus, isn't it? It just goes, no, no, no. Not, not, us, not, not us intelligent beings. Uh, we'll just have target yeah. masters. Notice that. <laughs> but yeah, I think they're really nice designs. I, li- I like the, the bright colours of like... Um, is it uh, Skull Cruncher? Mm. The green and the purple. That's really cool. They they were better. Actually, the Autobot ones were generally quite boring, I think, except Max, obviously. Mm. Um, yeah. But like, they were a bit like generic robot guy and then like, I'm a tank. But the Decepticon ones were quite weird. Mm. I think if I was going to choose a favourite, I would probably choose Scorponok. Okay. Just because he's a really cool looking Transformer. Green, green and purple. Really nice kind of, you know, your typical um, secondary colour evil guy kind of stuff. You know, very green goblin. And he's got a cool alt mode and he's got quite a cool looking head. Yeah, I think he's he's great. But I mean, there's, there's, I say the Decepticons definitely got the better designs. Yeah, actually, I mean, I think, I, I, you know, you, you, might, you might expect me to say Fort Max because that was such a, um, such a, such a big win. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it is, it is amazing, but I think I would probably say Scorponok as well because I think yeah I like the color scheme as you say. I also had Scorponok, and yeah, it's just a great design. It's very fun. Like his legs move when you push the scorpion along, which is very nice detail. Oh, yeah. yeah, they kind of jump up and down, don't they? <laughs> he was also quite an interesting character in the comics as well, and they, they sort of because I think when he when he's introduced, he sort of takes over Zarek, and he's like, you know, I'm going to take over your brain, and you're basically mine now. <laughs> but um, it sort of changes, you know, it kind of shifts, and later on, he sort of becomes a bit, he becomes a more sympathetic character as like Zarak sort of is part, remains part of him. And I think he ends up making peace with crime at one point. Yeah. No, I was, I was going to say the same thing before I started wanging on about his design. <laughs> I was going to say another important thing for me is what a great character he was in the comic book. Yeah. Oh gosh. Do you, uh, what about what about you, Dave? Um, um, it shows how this, on the opposite side of the fence I am. I'm going to pick Fortress Maximus. It's, yeah. He's uh, yeah, he's, he's great. great. <laughs> we, we we agree with you. He is great. <laughs> he's just he's just um. It's like I think it's especially because of the Japanese side of it. It's just the whole. He's just such an imposing character once he transforms, and the sword and the. The spaceship has a weird name. In the show. They call it Spaceship Bruce. Of course, they uh, do. okay. But it's he's, he's, <laughs> fine. I actually, I actually really like his um his alt modes as well. Like a lot of the times, um, even the Times Return one is a bit ropey, but I still kind of like it. Like I like the idea of this massive city mm-hmm. and then a massive spaceship. And it, I don't know. Just in my head, it's always worked as a really cool design. Oh no, he's 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 a very cool design. I like the fact that he's got those cannons on his waist and the and the ones on his mm. legs and so on he's, he's he's bristling with weaponry yes that that mm. thing was very funny it has, even has these little tiny handguns that oh yeah nice details so you could sort of put him into attack mode and he was like so he bristling mm. with with weaponry i think also like as as dave said it's you know his, his his city mode works really well it's probably the only one 
of those that's like as, yeah. as good as that. Like the others were all a bit like Metroplex and Scorpion Opera, a bit like I, I don't really know what, what this is. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a base, but it was it was very it was very solidly made toy, and it sort of worked as a as a sort of big base city thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think either of the two leaders were pretty fantastic toys. Any honourable mentions? I suppose I would probably say Nightbeat. Yeah. Again, yeah. part of it's to do with the fact that he was such an interesting character in the comic book. But I really like that blue and yellow colour scheme. He's a cool character. And he, yeah, he was like a, a later headmaster. Yeah, there were those later headmasters. They were actually slightly cheaper, I think, weren't they? I mean, they yeah. Were, they were a bit simpler, but they, they were quite good. Mm. I mean, I guess an honourable mention, if, 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 this, if this counts which I think it sort of does, would be like Action Master Prime, which I thought, apart from being very easy to break, is, is a great toy. Oh, do you mean Power Master Prime? Sorry, yeah. Sorry, Action Masters is the later thing, isn't it? Yeah. Don't transform. Power Master Prime, yeah. He, he was very good. Yes. And I appreciate that finally his trailer was for something more than just like a kind of a base or just it disappears. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, it's, it's good when, when, when the trailer combines with the with the robot mm. rather than just kind of just being this thing that's to the one side um i, w- I would say uh chrome dome is probably be a runner-up for me yeah he's it's the weirdest color palette that you wouldn't think yeah, would it's work quite a good yeah <laughs> but it's sort of br- brown beige and orange but I, uh, I, I really i really i like how they 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 pushed him as like um as quite the poster boy for yeah they did a bit uh the like he was, I mean, I always, I always didn't think he was the leader until obviously I watched the show and found out about Fortress Maximus because he did seem to be more of a the headline of a lot of the battles and designs and things. Yeah, I wonder whether that's that. Whether that's partly got something to do with the fact that Fort Max wasn't released in this country. Maybe <laughs> possible, isn't it? Yeah, that actually that's a good call. Yeah, actually, I have a sad story about Chrome Dome. <laughs> <laughs> my, my friend, my brother's friend, uh, Declan, had Chrome Dome and brought him around. And I was playing with Chrome Dome and Soundwave, and I made Chrome Dome punch Soundwave in the head, and it came off. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> well, I think I, I, I later got a new Soundwave at a car boot sale for very little money, so oh, yeah. it's a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> Soundwave was quite hard to get as well. I think at that point. Yeah, yeah. Out of print. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> that's terrible. Poor yeah. Soundwave. <laughs> and Soundwave's one of my favourites. You don't want to punch his head off. It was a great toy, yeah. <laughs> my Does anyone have anything else they want to say about Headmasters? I, I think there's actually a bit of an elephant in the room with Headmasters, which is that a Headmaster is the name of the teacher who's in charge of the school. <laughs> and I found that <laughs> extremely jarring when I was a small child trying to yes. enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of get used to it, don't you? And then, in fact, I honestly, com- I completely separate the two things in my mind until, yeah. in preparation for this, I watched um, Headmasters The Basics, the YouTube. Oh, yeah. Chris McFreely, who does not need a plug on this podcast because he's huge, <laughs> makes a, a series of, of videos on um, on YouTube, which is basically that explains a particular character or a particular gimmick or whatever. And he was talking through Headmasters. And um, it wasn't until he got to the bit where he was talking about there being a Headmaster in The Last Night. And he showed a clip of it. Mm. And there's two humans sat there talking. One of them is uh, Marky Mark. Mm. And uh, this guy in a very kind of clipped British accent goes, oh, yes, he's a Headmaster. And I was like, oh, shit, yeah, like like a teacher. (laughs) Yeah, of course, because they don't have in America. It's, they don't have that word. It's principal, and I don't think we call it headmaster now. It's it's always a head teacher. Mm. Head teacher. Yeah, I guess it so, used yeah. to be headmaster or headmistress, and now they use a sort of non less gendered term. I imagine so. So even kids today probably wouldn't really wouldn't really flag that up. No, they wouldn't bat an eyelid. Our, gen- no. our generation had to deal with at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was very strange. Yeah, like we don't know anybody in our. Uh, in our regular lives, called a target master or a power master, but, no, but a headmaster. Or a micro master. He, he was the guy you, got, you had to go and talk to when you were in trouble. Yeah. I always just find it weird because the only other thing that I see in the, the everyday normal world um, with headmasters is that, that salon, that 
<laughs> I, I sent you a picture of this, like this this franchise called Headmasters. And I was like, "This is hilarious!" Like uh, what? you see it, and you're like, "Yeah." <laughs> 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 Well, lads, I think it's time to call it a day on this podcast, don't you? Uh, headmasters, who would have thought it would have been such a big topic? Uh, did you enjoy it? Did we miss anything? What are your thoughts on Headmasters? Let us know on social media. You can connect with us on Facebook, where there's an Arg My Optics page, and I'm Orion Gear on there. And on Twitter and Instagram, I am at Gear Orion and Orion underscore Gear, respectively. And if you want to talk Titans Returns, please do direct all correspondence to Virtual Dave. Where can they do that, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> At Virtual Dave 26 on Instagram. Fantastic. Uh, and talking of fantastic, it was great to have our first ever guest host. Thank you, Michael Quinson, for dropping in and talking Headmasters with us. Uh, did you have a good time? Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Great. Woo-hoo. So, if you enjoyed this as much as Dave, Michael and myself did... Uh, Why not express that enjoyment by liking, subscribing, sharing, all that jazz. We really do appreciate it. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening, and please join us next time on... Ah! Ah, Biotics! Biotics. (laughs)